Oh, like, yeah. It Tell has to happen. It. it has to happen. But oh, you just vibing. Suck it. Just vibing, man. You know how wonderful it is that in the year 2020, of all things, we can we can vibe across the world. <sighs> I know. Right? Right? Well, 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 where are you now? Right, you, you are in Memphis. Uh huh. Tennessee. Yes. And I'm in Seoul, Korea. Yes. Oh. On the peninsula. What is Ten- what is Tennessee? Tennessee is that the tray on the chef's plate? Oh, you explained <laughs> this. You explained this to me before regarding the the the, the South of America. That is exactly right. Uh, we are the tray, and do you remember what sits on top of the tray? <laughs> is it a turkey or some 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 American exactly. cuisine? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's Kentucky Fried Chicken, bro. No way. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. That's wow. Oh. Like, oh, out, of, out, of, out of all the thing I know about America, that that sticks with me. Like, oh, it's the tray. The hat is can. What is what is the hat? The hat is Atlanta. Atlanta is that what it is? Well, Atlanta is actually the uh, it, it that. That's in Georgia, which is uh, not not necessarily in the chef's uh, experience. And now that you ask me, chef's what experience. The, I don't, now that you ask me what the hat is, I'm really having a hard time. You know, Michigan's shaped like a, a mitt, so it's possible that it kind of has like a hat ish type shape. But now that you ask right, me, right, now that yeah. the pressure's on Eric Juan, I don't know the answer. The quiz. This is the quiz. No, you no, you don't know your country. No, I don't know shit about China either. But uh, hey. Never mind. Uh, well, you know, I mean, why not just start there? You want to go there? No, I hope you're not looking for any sort of Chinese company sponsorship in the future. No, <laughs> I don't imagine that that's oh, what oh, this will result in. Oh, 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 you might. I don't know. You, your 50 audiences. All right. Well, say. let's just let's just start here, because I imagine that most of the audience that is going to listen to this is from the States. And. As a as a as a person that can speak from firsthand experience, um, we're not necessarily taught a whole lot about other countries' history. Um, as you oh, can tell, okay. I'm having a hard time with geography on my chef hat. How am I <laughs> supposed to know the inner workings of a dynamic? But what I'd love for us to do is, I would love for us to create some context together. And what sure. we can do is give somebody the uh, uh, the kindergarten version of the dynamic, Eric. Um, for those that don't know, is from Hong Kong. And so since Eric is from Hong Kong, there are some things that he has uh, that he can share about some things that have been going on. And so could you tell us a little bit about like the basic history of Hong Kong and how uh, it came under British rule and all of those things? Mm. Yeah, I think it, it, it is something that I got into since I was young. I'm going to tell you a bit of a history. Uh, I mean, the facts may be a little bit murky at time because this is just a, a very brief explanation of something that's very, very complicated as you can see and then and I have the benefit of having learned the history from both sides. Mm. Let's say if you learn the, the history from the Chinese side they would tell you that oh bad British people selling drugs to the Chinese. But then if you have learned it from the other side which I, which, which I had had the opportunity of learning since I was educated in Britain. I'm very, very fortunate that my father used to work for the uh, British government in the, colon- the colonial British government, right? Because I was born uh, before 1997, which was when Britain hand back Hong Kong to, uh, to China. And my father used to work for the British, go- British government, right? British colonial government back in Hong Kong. It's funny that like when you're a kid, you remember little stuff, right? You, need, you, you have a little, you have a bit of a memorability of everything based on things that you've seen, based on things that you have touched, based on things that you have eaten even. So I always remember my father sometimes he doesn't take a lot of work back home because why would you right you're a civil servant uh, he always told me that oh, life was easy back then like you go to work like 9 nine thirty, you do a bit of work until like lunchtime, and then you go out for lunch and then you come back do a little bit more work until 3 3 15 and then it's tea time as he, he always told me like tea time right british uh, 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 British uh, culture. So we have a bit of tea and then around 4.30 and then he would take a nap and then he would go home and then he would still bring a very, very hefty, nice paycheck back home and a lot of benefit. But I always remember that he would take uh, some, some ladder hat back home 
some some kind of some sort of documents. I remember this brown envelopes that you would have with a little, you know, the string thing. You have a little yeah, circle yeah. thing on top. I know exactly what you mean. And then and two circle on top of the envelope, so you can. Those like, felt official, and you did the little eight pattern. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 draw the thing around it, the string around it, and then the thing you can't open it if you are four year old. Then on top of that letter had you know, they were always on top of the envelope. It will always say HMS. H dot M dot S. Mm. And I would get very, very curious because that is almost exactly the same as my personal initial mm-hmm. of my Chinese name. Because my Chinese name, my name is Eric Song Him Wan. So we like H M S. We like, oh, is that is that for me, father? Song Him? <laughs> something. So no, no, no. Let me explain something to you, son. Uh, H M S means Her Majesty's Services. Mm. I'm working for the queen, my son. He would tell me, he's like, oh, ooh, that's awesome. Like the queen, queen? I said, yeah, the queen, queen. And it's crazy to think about it that Brooks, that she's still alive today, right? She's still kicking. She's, yeah. she's about to give a speech in the new year. I wonder what she's going to say. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a conversation for an even deeper story. But yeah, how like queen, queens in general that, that still exist, right? Queens but in this, general, like, like yeah. it, it's a wild concept. It's a wild concept for me. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I obviously has always been fascinated by this idea of like our identity, like, like Hong Kong's identity, which is something that's came out a lot in 2019. Since this whole thing that we have seen the news, what, what happened, there's a lot of protest, there's a lot of unrest in the region, in, in our city. But the story, like going back to the history, is very, very fascinating. It's, it's a history of, uh, I would say, as you, Brooks, Mr. Master Metal, you are a master in business administration, so you find this interesting as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a story of globalization, trade deficit, and war. So this goes back to many, many years ago, I would say 200 something years ago. Uh, so British people love tea. I don't know if you have seen the meme <laughs> of like, oh, <laughs> put some leaves in water. British people go wild. Yeah. <laughs> so they really like tea. <laughs> it's something that they, 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 mm. they discover through trade. It's something that they discover through the expeditions in the East. Uh, that they, they really like tea. They really like silk. And they really like a lot of the uh, China, right? China, the, 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 the actual uh, uh, cutlery, the plates. Yeah. They, it's all something very, very fascinating to the European world back then. So being the trading comp the, the, the trading empire that they are obviously they want more of those so they can bring it back to europe and then they would sell it for a huge profit right huge huge profit you got to realize that the tea trade the silk trade and the china trade uh, the ceramic china trade it was huge back in europe because none of this stuff is it's not like now where we take things for granted right we just all this shit from amazon and then we get it in in, in seven days but back then, it's a whole journey of uh, a long journey, right? It takes months to ship those goods back then. It's dangerous. There are pirates, you know, uh, not, not Somalian pirates, but actual pirates that would take your shit and kill you. Uh, so it's a dangerous trade, but it, the benefit is huge. It's, it's, a, it's, a, there's, it's a huge paid off if you're brave, brave enough. And... And so they love it, right? They make a lot of money. The traders make a lot of money. The traders got really powerful in the British government, in the British parliament. And the interesting thing regarding this trade relationship between China back then, the the Qing and the British uh, empire is the Chinese government, the Chinese empire back then is not very open back then. They were only allowed trade in certain places. And down south, south of China, the Guangdong province, where Hong Kong is located, is one of those places mm. that they would allow uh, Westerners, right? I don't know if you, uh, if you know the, China, the Cantonese term for uh, Westerners is guailo. I don't know if you heard that term before. Maybe you have heard it. Maybe some of your listeners have heard that before. Uh, it, guai is literally uh, means ghost. 
low is just a dude, right? So for Westerners, the 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 the, the, the great term is the ghost person, like the ghost, the go- ghastly looking dude. So to speak, because because for, 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 for yeah, the, yes. the, the white person, right? The white yes. person. Wow. And for <laughs> back then, that's how so the, so specific. Very exact. Yeah, that's you right. ghost yeah, you guys look. <laughs> the so ghost, look, ghost looks like the ghost. You're not <laughs> supposed to look dude. like that as a human yeah. being. Like, like, you got blue eyes. We've hair, been here hair. for a couple of thousand years now, and as far as we can tell, you're not supposed to look that white. <laughs> I know, right? You're just, your eyes are not supposed to look that look that way. Blue, you're like, yeah, you're exactly. Not, oh, totally. You're not from this world. You're not. People from this just world, take right? this. People take this uh, so for granted now that. We yeah we've been so exposed to the vast variety of life through the age of the internet we've literally forgotten what it could possibly even be like to be a human back then. It just doesn't even yeah, register. Just, Let's go. Of course, register, they, right? you, if you call just, someone, like you know what I'm saying, if you created words now to create and, and to uh, categorize or call somebody something you just met, and it was as uh, as overt as like white ghost. You use your own term, and you use yeah. your term. Yeah, exactly. That's a, right. it's, People it's would a, never understand. You, I mean, I always trying to preach this. Like, people will only understand things that you're trying to explain to them in their own terms. Yes, yes. And so you, you, you like, you can't force them to understand things that in your terms. Mm. Like, they will only understand things in their terms. Yeah. No. It. it, and it in is. In order for them to understand it, you have to create an experience for them to understand it. Before I let you continue, I'm going to hammer this one thing. It's that this is ha- this relationship that you're describing has unfolded over hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. OK, and things like that evolve uh, uh, so deep and in, into culture. It just is accepted as the norm for hundreds of years. So things that are Absolutely. unusual to us now have been normal for hundreds of years, deep in cultures that much older than the United States. So it's hard for us uh, as Americans, I'm imagining, is because we we don't really have a sense of scale of history because we've only been a part of it for like, you know, quarter of a quarter of a millennium. It's not that long, a little over a quarter of a millennium. So this is it. This is many, many times the United States is age old, I believe, uh, this relationship that you're describing between the British Empire and the Chinese. Is that correct? It is absolutely, and 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 I think people need to understand that the old ways or tradition, however way you want to call it, it works back in the past because it worked right. It helped you to survive, it helped you to thrive as a community, as a as a, as a group. It works because there are way. I mean, you 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 cannot discount that that it had worked before. But then I think the beauty of the human human race or whatever civilization is, you you got to evolve. At a certain stage, you gotta move past it, right? I think something that you, you know, Brooke, you have experienced when you're in Asia, in in Korea specifically, is the age system, right? It's where people that are for those of for those of your listener who doesn't is not familiar. I don't know if you've spoken about this before. In the Korean culture, if you are even by twelve months, if you're older than a person by twelve months, you're superior for some reason. Yeah, you you have to be spoken to respectfully. Mm. You you can you can be particularly. I mean, the Korean language is very complicated, right? You know that there's different tiers. You have the polite tier. You have the like. Bet- you have a language that you only use for your superior, right? So the hierarchy uh, is built into the language itself. So that makes culture change a little bit different, right? But but I think English is because English is a lot more easier it's more flexible so i do believe that change is is is, uh, is possible in a lot of places but korea i mean there's another question there's another discussion for longer uh for another longer podcast regarding the the, the, the asian culture itself but going back to the history of hong kong right yeah like, we're gonna break uh, this we're gonna we're gonna explain this all of asian like this, is, this is the uh, one that we did it i thought is this gonna it. be like the <laughs> The, the the hard court history of 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 what's his name? Have you heard of this podcast? Yes, yes. Oh, what is his very name? Thorough. Dan Car- 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 very thorough. Very Dan Carlin. Very thorough, and each one is like three. Yeah, three Dan Carlin. Yeah, it's, each Dan one is Carlin. like three hours, and he has like twelve of this just to talk about Japan. Yeah. It's amazing. It, he is it. really is amazing. No, no, you're right. Oh, but we we will stay back on. So this trade relationship. So so there's only specific places you can trade between China. 
Britain. And so, and the thing is the Chinese empire back in the days, right? This whole system of trade. So China would give them silk, tea and other goods. And then the Britain, and they will only accept one thing from Europe, Europeans, from Britain. Eric. They were only doing it. Hey, Eric. Yep. I'm going to, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop video and I'll edit all this out. Yeah. We don't yeah. need video, right? Um, we can just yeah. stop. I'll stop video and then um, just pick back up at uh, like what the Westerner, they would only take one thing from Westerners. Well, they don't know. Okay, so they only so they would take so the Chinese government so the Chinese so the Chinese empire would be selling stuff like tea, silk, and other goods, and they will only take one thing from Europe, and they will only take one thing from Britain, and that's silver. They will not take take anything else, and and this is very very important when it comes to the history of Hong Kong, right, and the history of the the, the dynamic between China and Britain at this stage. We'll, we'll come back to that later, and they only take silver. Uh, they, one of the reasons that people speculated and why they will only take silver uh, is because uh, this is something that if is I would be very sad to say is the corrupt nature of the. Uh, Chinese culture when it comes to uh, uh, doing trade. So we got to understand that Britain uh, tried to offer a lot of stuff. They tried to offer technology, right? Oh, do you want to, do you want ship building technologies? Do you want uh, gunpowder? Do you want technologies on building, uh, uh, making better guns? Do you want technologies on making back better military doctrines, military uh, tra training methods, any sort of technology? And the Chinese government would say no. And we don't want anything but silver. Uh, so there are many reasons why they only accept silver. One of the reasons is, as I, as I told you earlier, that there are only very specific places that you can trade uh, for Chinese good in China. And they're all based in, a, a lot of them are based in the Guangdong province. And within these provinces, you have uh, specific trading companies called Hong. And this company, Hong, this company would do business with Westerners and then they would get the profit and then they would, and a cut of the profit would be given to the uh, empire government as, as trade tax. So the reason that they would not accept anything else other than silver is because you cannot corrupt with, uh, you cannot take a cut of technology. You cannot take a cut of, of gunpowder, uh, uh, a technology you cannot take a you can't take any cut of that right you, you, but you can take a cut of silver you can steal from the government if you're only trading with silver and the important things this is this is part of the global economics come global economic kind of a things uh, have an impact of this whole uh, trade relation right so uh, back then europe is trying to uh is it, it, i think it would say it's the beginning of the start of a real financial system and in order for you to have a real financial system a real banking system so to speak then you would need a currency right you need coins you need a way to uh stop bothering for stuff right you need a standard standardized ways to do trade and one of the ways is to by minting coins and one of the material that is used to mint coins is silver so Britain at that stage is under a real, real crunch when it comes to the money side of things, right? When it comes to the financing of this, because they are having this huge trade surplus uh, deficit between China and UK, right? China is taking a lot of silver out of the country, uh, while at the same time, they're getting a lot of goods. But at the same time, domestically, they have a demand for silver. They need the silver to make money so they can trade within the Europe, right? So, so now then Britain has a problem. They are losing a lot of silver. They're not getting enough of silver. And also at the same time, the Chinese government is unwilling to accept anything but silver. 
So what do they do, right? So they have this huge economic problem. So they, they offer a lot of things. They offer, they offer technology, they offer guns, they offer other kind of goods and the Chinese uh, traders, they're not interested in it because you can't take a cut of those kind of stuff, right? You can't get rich of those kind of things. Until one day, so this is where the globalization part of the of the whole of the whole situation uh, uh, comes into play, right? Until one day, for some reason, I don't know the exact history, uh, one particular type of goods made their way into China and from Britain's uh, trade route and become really really popular. One goods, one goods that the Chinese Chinese trader actually say, you know what? Hmm. Yeah, I want this. I would trade you, uh, I would trade you with this, with, with the goods that we have, and then I would give you, actually, I would give you silver for this particular type of goods. And this type of goods itself actually did not came from Britain. Uh, this type of uh, goods actually came from uh, India, which is also a part of the British Empire. So you can see the globalizations are uh, starting to come into play, right? So you got goods that uh, the Brit British uh, Empire got from India, and then they can trade it to China, and in return, they can get silver as well as tea, as well as other stuff that they need. So, so this trade deficit uh, actually got turned around because of this particular situation because, and because of this particular good from India. And uh, as some of you listening might have already knew this particular type of good is what we call, what they call opium back in the days. Ah, drugs, man. Drugs, so drugs. Drugs, and so India and China don't have a direct relationship, so now the British Empire is running middleman on the... Oh, no, the, the British Empire, they, they run India, you got to remember. Right, they're actually colonized India. At they colonize point. it, so they have a very, very low cost when it comes mm. to getting opium into, mm. in, into China. And they need that actually, silver no. back. And, they, and they're going to get the silver back, and they will also get the, key, get the tea that they want. Mm. So now you see this. I mean, so now this is this so as the as, as the meme said, how the turntable, right? Mm -hmm. So now the table has turned. Now then, all the silver is coming out of China. Now then, all the goods are leaving China with very very little in return, and everybody is getting high back home and getting fucked up. Mm -hmm. Nobody's working. <laughs> Nobody's working. Nobody's working. Everybody's getting fucked up. When is this approximately in history? So this, I would say, I would say is in the, in the 18, 18, 1800s. Yeah. Okay. I'm feeling that. Yeah. In the 1800s, right? In the 1800s. So, I mean, I should know better than this, but then we, we're just going, going by the story here. So I'm not going to give you the exact date. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, no, we, we that, can look at it later. Don't don't worry about exact dates. I, I think eighteen hundred because if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the U.S. was under a a push for imperialization alongside the Brits, and the Brits happened to win that round. Absolutely. So so I think it was around eighteen thirty to eighteen forty. So it was around that time. And and I would say that's 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 the one the real opium rule. And and you got to understand the US is also the, is also uh, ex doing a lot of trade with China back then, right? So so that is the whole so you're going to understand and that would exactly explain a lot of the attitude that the current Chinese government have when it comes to uh, foreign policy. Cuz you got to understand that Hong Kong the whole history of Hong Kong has always been a black spot in the history of China. In a sense that, that that is a period of in the whole history of China where they were actively being invaded and taken advantage of by European and American uh, uh, foreign power. Mm. Right to a stage that where I would say eight country actually set up uh, a district in China at those stages. At, in those years and they would take a cut and say this is my district this is the french district the this is the district. Best, the, exactly yeah 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 i think if yeah. you go to shanghai you can still see the french district right the french quarter uh i think in, in one of the area you can still see the traditional french colonial uh, uh, uh architecture even all the way up to shanghai wow district. yeah so so now the empire have a situation right so now he's not getting his tax 
and then he's because uh, you gotta understand that south is quite south for China. It's quite far from the empire. Mm. So back in the days, I would say uh, the 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 oh, I think Beijing and Nanjing is is a long way away. It's a long way away, and 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 a lot of the time the empire doesn't know stuff. The em- empire, the em- the the, the, the yeah, empire. How could they? Is, yeah, doesn't. It's far away, and you so only. Important. And 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 the people you don't have to tell him the truth. Yeah. If you're the if you're the if you're the governor <laughs> then self, right? You don't yeah, have man, to tell him the truth. He wouldn't know. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and, easy like, we so take you gotta understand. Yeah. So, so he wild. doesn't know, right? You can't take yeah. a picture. You, 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 like, yeah. It's not like you can take a picture <laughs> and, 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 tweet and, and, and and tweet it. Tweet it. <laughs> hey, yo, Emperor dude, what's happening? So many white people. You get uh, like, you're getting wiped out, Emperor. You're getting wiped out. You like, nobody's it. working. Everybody's <laughs> like just lying around doing nothing. So he doesn't. He actually doesn't realize it until the the money stop coming in, right? Because mm. oh, why are you not giving me my my levies, right? Why 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 is my tax not coming in? And then the people tell them, right? And then the governments, the the governors, thanks have tell them, oh, you know what? Yeah, we we've kind of been doing this kind of deal going on, and people has been. Uh, we've been getting a lot of opium <laughs> and we, we kind of been giving them silver away and then the emperor was pissed off he got mad right he got mad you gotta understand back in the days like the, the word uh, i think people have like been saying a lot of people know about this right the, the words china the words in, in in chinese mean is Zhongguo, right Zhongguo in cantonese Zhongguo in in mandarin Zhong means middle. Mm. Guo means country. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard a stand up bit about this. So they are literally, they think they're in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the universe, right? Mm. So imagine you are the emperor of this country. And you heard that, you know what? We've been, we've, we've been scammed. We've been, uh, we've been bamzoomed by the devils. You're pissed. You're angry, right? So, so, so he asked his governor, Dang Sao. He asked his people, Dang Sao. He asked all these trade companies, like, so what is happening? We've been getting a lot of silver. Why we stop getting all this silver? What is the cost? And people like to play, they, they would never accept that, that. Oh, you know what? We've been corrupted. We've been actually taking money out of you, but then now all this stuff, like we've been off all kinds of technology that would be greatly beneficial for, for our country, but we all reject it because we, we, we if we take them, then we, we will get less money, less profit in return. They just say, Absolute, oh. Absolutely zero incentive to say anything. Of course. Well, they will only say opium. Yeah. Drugs. Bad devil giving, giving us opium, poisoning our people. So this is the history where if you're educated in China or in any of the Chinese uh, influence uh, spheres of education, they will tell you that, oh, because opium, uh, yeah. because the, the Westerners, they sell opium, they poison our people, and we have decided to fall, fall, fall back, right? Mm. No, nobody but actually would mention the whole in re- in reality, yeah. of thing. In, in reality, the <laughs> things that were going on is they were being offered all sorts of things. It's just the one that they would take unless it was silver, uh, unless they were receiving silver, the only other thing that they would take in exchange and give silver for was opium. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. feeling it. And then the, the, the fucking scam as it, the, the scam, you know, the jig is always up as they say, the you know, jig eventually is up. the jig is up and, and you have up. to face the emperor and you're like, emperor, man, Hey, listen. Um, yeah. It's all the drugs, man. And you, you don't, you, why would, cause you know, you're getting your head chopped off or something. If you're like, yeah, well, we could have taken this other thing, but we chose not to, you know, you know, you're getting your head chopped off or the equivalent of whatever that was back in the day from the emperor. Um, so you absolutely say nothing. You blame it on the drugs. It, it's a, it's a really it, Occam's razor, man. It's like the simplest explanation of all, especially when you consider like human tendency to protect it oneself you know the emperor is staring you down you don't know that the decisions that you're making are going to be influencing textbooks in china in 2020 <laughs> you have no idea and it's easy and it's an easy easy safe scapegoat blame the devil blame the things that you are not familiar with blame the thing that scares you mm-hmm. is always the easiest thing to blame a outsider 
where in reality, you should be looking internally at your own economic problem and your own technology problem and your own corruption problem, right, Brooks? Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, you said it, man. I mean, I'm not pointing any fingers, but well, uh, <laughs> on a micro on a micro level, on a micro level, what you said makes absolute sense because that's the only way to fix any sort of problem in an individual's life is to assume responsibility from the inside. Because if I'm always pointing my finger out and saying it's because of all of these things outside of myself that I can't do this or that, like I'm not taking ownership and responsibility of the situation. And therefore, I can't grow from that at all, right? Absolutely. I can't step into Absolutely. growth at all. Um, so on a micro level, it makes absolute sense to me. Uh, on a macro level, um, when politics uh, and money and egos and uh, uh, military get involved, things can get really, really complicated really, really fast. Okay, so when ex uh, about when did British take over rule? I know we said they passed it off in 1997, but when did approximately uh, Britain take over the uh, colonization of, of Hong Kong? So it was it was multiple parts, right? So so again, like you said, on a personal level or on a on a on a larger level, when you look at the problem at the on the wrong, and you when you blame the wrong reason, then you apply the wrong solution to it, right? So they blame OPM. So what happened is they assigned a person to deal with this problem, and what they did is they that person that has been assigned to this problem, he go went down south, and then he go ahead and seize all the opium from all the British traders, all the external, all the Western traders, and then he burned the shit out of it. And then he burned all of it. Problem solved, right? You burn all of it, problem solved. Uh, it didn't solve anything. It pissed off the traders. The traders say, hey, I lost all my goods. So they went back to complain to the British government and say, hey, I lost all this money. And you gotta understand they have a lot of influence right now, right? They have a lot of influence in, in the British government. So then the British government say, hey, what do you want me to do? And then the traders say, I want you to start a war. I want you to, I want you to t teach these, these Chinese people a lesson. So I think it was in it about 1840, 1840, then the British Navy came around to China to conduct this, the first opium war, I would say, right? Uh, so in this, you, you're gonna understand, right? So we have, to, we have to throw back, we have to go back to, remember I told you that the Chinese traders, they would not accept any sort of things other than silver, right? Yes. And that include technology. Correct. That, in, that include stuff like military technology. Correct. So it all comes back to that, right? So, mm. so it was so bad. They lost so bad because the British Empire at that stage, they perfected colonial warfare. They're really good at it. They're really good at killing people. Mm. I mean, the warfare wasn't, I mean, I think it's not, wasn't even fair. Like there, there yeah. are plays, there, it wasn't fair. It was not fair. There was, there was actually like Chinese guns would not, that were outmatched in terms of, in terms of range. Oh God! Pen penetration, yeah, and also military uh, training. Mm. So it wasn't even fair. So, so they completely destroyed the Chinese army. They have very very minimal loss. And then I was in, uh, I think it was in 1842. Then the empire actually said, you know what? Uh, this is this is this is bad. This is really bad, right? This is really bad that they actually. So they they have to say, oh, you want? It's time to. Uh, sign a treaty and it's time to uh, uh, trying to uh, come to a peace term. And then the British Empire uh, decided to take the Hong Kong Island to as part of the treaty. And, uh, and, and you gotta understand at that stage, Hong Kong was nothing, right? It, it, it was not for agricultural, it's, it's, it's literally a floating piece of rock. Uh, I can't really do a lot of stuff in Hong Kong Island, but then the British traders and, and also the, 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 the empire, they have the foresight of noticing that Hong Kong has a very unique uh, 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 geographical feature that it has a very, very deep harbor. Mm. So all kinds of ships can dock there very, very easily. And it's a very, very useful trade and also strategic point for the, uh, 
for, for the Western traders and also the British Empire to, to do stuff. So that's the first opium war, pretty much the gist, gist of it, right? And then there's also another second uh, opium war where the British Empire took a larger part of the southern parts of China, that what they call uh, the New Territory, and also the Kowloon Peninsula as well. It, it got really bad. It got really bad that 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 the war was so one-sided that the army actually went, the, the British army actually went all the way to Beijing and then the, the, one of the summer palace was burned by the army, by, by, by the West. Uh, they burned the summer palace. And, and even the forbidden, for, forbidden city, the one that you see now in Beijing, they, they, it, part of it was occupied by the foreign force as well. I so you gotta, have been there and had no idea. Yeah, yeah, of course they will never tell you. So, <laughs> so it, it, so you gotta understand that the, the whole idea of Hong Kong, the whole uh, history of Hong Kong, is absolutely a a black spot in the long, long, long history of of the Chinese uh, 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 culture itself. Right? It's always a reminder of how. Uh, how 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 poorly managed China was back in the 18th and early 19th century, and that really put a lot of a lot of a, a, a context into how huge of a deal it was in 1997, when uh, when Britain willingly gave up part of their territory back to Hong Kong, or even when it was in the 1982 when they actually signed the agreement. Uh, British Sino, uh, the, the yeah, the British Sino agreement on agreeing to give Hong Kong back to to China, it, like people people always say that the, uh, the 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 Beijing Olympic was the coming out party, right? Mm -hmm. Of the, but I would argue that the handing over of Hong Kong is actually the coming out party for the uh, communist government to take take back territory. That's mm -hmm. that's a huge deal in terms mm -hmm. of the again. The of the, it's yeah. it. I want to hammer home that this has spanned hundreds of years. And so it's just the context of it is it's so big. It can't be encompassed in one, two, three, four, five lifetimes. You know, it's huge. What happened? Yeah. 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 Um, the Olympics are great. Don't get me wrong, but I think they'll get it back in less than a couple of hundred years. You know what I'm saying? So I, I agree with you. I think that that is actually something that, um, probably doesn't, I mean, I, I guess we talk about uh, China and how it's, you know, rise since the 90s, but that step of receiving back territory, um, it is, it's, it's, it's a landmark, landmark. It is, yeah. it is, this is like Russia taking back Alaska. Imagine that. Yeah, uh, right. Exactly. Very strange. Um, very strange to even think about it as an American. If we were, yeah, very strange. Keep going, <laughs> keep going, man. This is fascinating. Keep Please. So, so this is what it is, right? So we've been under British rule for almost two hundred something years, and then in the eight, so, so you can understand the British colonial government. They are really good at doing what they do. They are really good at colonizing places in a sense that they would give you a certain amount of freedom to make sure that you don't revolt. Mm -hmm. I think that is a hallmark of a good empire, right? You talk about, you can talk about whatever military might or, or whatever economic pro, uh, power, power an empire has, but uh, uh, the, the power of an empire, really one of the elements lies in how well they can govern. Mm. In terms of can they integrate with the local populations and can the local populations uh, integrate into the empire and feel part of that? feel like that they are part of the empire to not revolt back to the the original uh, status quo yes and to do that you cannot rule with an iron fist you, you got to win hearts and mind right it's always about hearts and mind mm -hmm. you have to come to so the british government have conducted a lot of policy that is directly or even indirectly has no benefit for the British government other than making the local populations uh, 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 not revolt. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, housing program in the early days of colonial period, 
they, they, they created perfect housing for Hong Kong, which is a new concept, right? Because back in the days, like in nothing like this exists. Mm-hmm. Healthcare, education, free education system, uh, making a piece of shit fishing, fishing village into one of the world uh, top financial city ever. Uh, creating one of the best financial uh, stock market that is on par with New York, Tokyo, London from a piece of shit fishing village and directly uh, benefit fitting the local population, right? Mm -hmm. Making Hong Kong one of the highest uh, uh, living standard in the world today, right? And so that is something that they do really well and you, you can understand so so i see if to and to explain that i have to give a little bit of a personal history right so so some of you might know me as uh, as brooks friend we met in korea while i'm studying my mba uh as i said earlier my father worked for the government right and because he worked for the british government i was able to go and study in Britain for practically free since the age of 14 to the age of 21. Uh, I was giving a lot of benefit. I was giving free air ticket to fly home and back to Britain, uh, to Britain and back home on a yearly basis to receive educations. And, and you gotta understand, like nowadays, when you talk about overseas students, right? You, you, like back then, Chinese students, I've, do you have a lot of Chinese students in, in some of the university in, in, in Memphis, in Tennessee? We had a lot, uh, we had a, a, for a small university that I went to, we had a pretty fair mix uh, of like foreign students, but we didn't have an exceptionally high rate of uh, Chinese students specifically. Okay. So back then Chinese students, and I'm talking about the 90s, back then Chinese students are Hong Kong students, right? in the right. US, especially in, 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 uh, in the UK. Mm. And, and it's not like that we are exceedingly rich. So these days, if you go to like USC or UCLA or or, or even the, uh, 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 the the better colleges or better universities in 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 the UK in Europe, these are all rich Chinese students. Right? Yeah, they all, I understand. They all, drive, they all drive very nice car and they are very very good uh, uh, pocket money from their parents. But back then, like to give you a bit of a perspective, one of my classmates, he's also from Hong Kong. When we when we live we live in a we went to a boarding school. They call it public school in the UK, right? And the best way for you to understand what how a boarding school is in the UK is to think about Harry Potter. So literally, like you you go to you go to your boarding school, you live in a very very old house, you live in a very old building that's like two hundred something years old that have people died in it. Uh, we will we literally have a plague in front of this in front of the main school building. That has a list of the name of students that went to World War One and World War Two. Wow! Like like kids that died in World War One, right? Right. That's, that's how old the school is. Uh, older than Korea, I would say. Uh, and uh, and to give a and and you would think that oh, this kind of school must must be very expensive. It is. It is very expensive, but for us, it's not because. Our father, our parents work for the British government and they give us benefit to experience this kind of a thing. Like one of my very good friends, one of my friends also from Hong Kong, his father is a postman. And his son can't afford to go to this kind of like very, very prestigious boarding school, right? So that it gives you a sense of how how much uh, how, 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 how much benefit that, yeah. that, that the government has given to some the people right you think about it a postman like and this days no not in korea right certainly not in the u.s i can't imagine a, a son of a postman can go stay in a full boarding school in the uk in london right that's crazy mm-hmm. that's crazy so that gives you so you can understand that a lot of the policy that like people will always say when when uh, like if we bring that a little bit closer to what we have experienced in 2019 and 2020 uh people will always say yeah but back then under the British government, you never had democracy neither. So what, what's the big deal? Why are you, uh, why are you itching for it? 
and people fail to understand this. We, we're not asking just for democracy. We are asking for a government that would make policy that is for our benefit. A government that would make policy and do things that has our best interest in mind, which is, has not happened since 1997. Mm. And the way that we felt that the only way for a government to make policy to have their people interests in mind is through a government that is elected by the people. So right now, our uh, head of the city, mayor, or however you want to call it, I always I always say that Hong Kong since the 90s, 90s, since we've been given back, is ran like a country. <laughs> oh, it's not ran like a city. It's not ran like a country. It's ran like a company. Mm. A, a company where we are the employees. <laughs> the people of Hong Kong is the employees. And China is the biggest shareholder and and. and and whatever people that they get get benefits out of it. So we work our asses off and we don't get the benefit of it. Mm. So much so that if you look at the current uh, Carrie Lam, right? She's been in the news a lot. She's, she's been sanctioned by the US government, by the way, which is a pain in the ass. So she can't use any credit cards. So when, you, when you're sanctioned by the US government, no US company will do business with you. That included uh, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, Amazon. So she literally said, oh, I'm very proud to be sanctioned by the US government. I I'm doing work for Motherland. I, have a st I just have a stack of cash back on that I use. But anyway, this person, if you look at her job title, right? What is her job title? So let's say, so what is the head person of Memphis? Uh, what is the head, head government official in Memphis? What is his job title, Brooks? Yeah, he is the mayor. He's the mayor, right? A city of Memphis mayor. City of Hong Kong, the name is called Chief Executive. Literally, CEO. Wow. So that gives you a bit of an understanding on whose best interest does she have when it comes to making policies. Yeah. You are the board and shareholders. The board and shareholders. And we are not the board and shareholders. Seven millions of us, we are not the board and shareholders. Mm. So the whole reason is through, since 97, through a lot of policy makings, through a lot of decision making by the government that we, the people of Hong Kong, felt that the government is no longer making any of these policies in our best interest, which is a complete opposite of what the British government have more or less done for us in the past, right? So that's a lot of the, that's, that's where a lot of the uh, discontent came from when it comes to uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the protest, I think it's just a little bit of the, uh, it's, I would say, what do you call that? It's just this final straw that broke the camel's back, man. Yeah. To be very honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. So once these things, I, I, my limited understanding of the current situation in Hong Kong is this, is that there were terms and conditions that Hong Kong had the ability to operate with a certain level of autonomy until the year 2040. And uh, here we are in the year 2020 and 2019, and that timeline seems to be ha ha have to have been accelerated by, by quite some time. Is there any insight as to why there's been such an aggressive uh, push from that side? And hmm. um, is there any insight that you can share on where you think things are headed? So I think the reason that why it has been pushed, like why the Chinese government has 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 done such a aggressive push for that is because we've been making a lot of noises recent since the past 20 or uh, 15 years that and, and you gotta understand the dynamic of the Chinese government half the rest of the world I think that has that has a huge uh, uh, factor uh, on why the Chinese government has done what he's done in the in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the whole idea of Hong Kong, like like people, like the 50 years of, of autonomy, right? 
the whole idea, the initial vision is for Hong Kong to act as a bastion of, of, of progressive uh, democratization of China through using Hong Kong as an example of how well democracy works and how well uh, how well free freedom of speech and freedom of, of, of assembly worked and hoping to use it to influence the rest of China. But I think what China has seen enough is because and why they wanted to stop that is because now they felt that at this stage internationally and, and, and I don't want to place any blame and on any particular government and because now China see there's an opportunity where the other uh, country particularly uh, US particularly in Europe that there is enough instability that there is no checks and balance anymore when it comes to what they could do internally at least at least that they themselves have enough status quo status quo in the global uh, political uh, environment where they could basically do whatever they want internally and nobody would tell them to, you know what, you can't do that. Or even if they say it, there's no replication and consequences to that. Right. And, because there's such a, because they have so much influence, uh, it's no one's going to contest it at this point in the game. Absolutely. Like they signed an agreement with Britain, right? The, uh, the, the agreement that is going to 50 years there where there will be autonomy and there will no change until 2047 and they totally broke the agreement and what is boris johnson going to do about it well they're having their own circumstances because and again you were talking it's not a coincidence that 2019 2020 is the year that they that they chose to move on it so quickly because um the uk was tied up in its brexit conversation and yeah, absolutely. So there's nothing you can do, right? You straight up broke an agreement that is sanctioned by the UN. Right. And there's you disruption can. internally. And when there's disruption internally, they don't have enough internal uh, uh, agreement. to. There, If you're fighting on the inside, guess who you're not fighting? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So and there's, there's, a, there's a, And again, uh, I, I don't want to. Here's what I don't want to do with this conversation. I don't want to make it out that um, China has used tools and tactics that other countries have either tried to use or currently use. Um, the United States has been known to, uh, you know, influence other elections around the U.S. This is just history. And so, um, you know, if we have uh, done some of these things, it's kind of hard to be overly critical. Now, it's not my, you know, but here's what I am saying. I'm saying that, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that things happen when they happen. It, it, the China owns a considerable amount of U.S. debt that they could call the card on, you know, when they want. Uh, but there's also a vested ecosystem. There's an, there's an ecosystem that's been created where everybody's winning together. But as the influence is starting to shift, more and more things like this are starting to pop up and happen. Um, yeah. whether it's surveillance programs that have been known uh, that have been banned in other countries around the world um, in the Aus in Australia, particularly, and then removal of Huawei products and even uh, access to services here in the United States. There's just a lot of uncertainty around um, motive, intention and who's on the right side of history here. You know, it's a very strange, weird time to see it happening unfold yeah. in real time. Um, one of the key principles in the United States is the power of the individual, you know, the individual to live, a live in choice about it and, and make their own decisions about life within the context of the law. Um, but little by little, you know, law gets a little bit tighter. The system mm. gets a little bit bigger. There, there needs to be checks and balances that allow it to survive. You know, once entities are created, whether it's a corporation or a government, um, they have a vested interest in keeping it going. You know, it's a self-fulfilling thing. And a lot of a lot of people are just people. You know, I know it can be very easy to assume that there's like this secret group of really uh, uh, elite people that are making decisions um, that are shaping the world nonstop. And while that is in a way true in certain board meetings and certain uh, international organizations, what's also true is that 
really it's just humans have, behaving like humans do. And if you look at the course of history, there, there's very little different about the dynamics and the, and the tension of the world. It's just moved right. into a modern context and a modern economy with modern technology. And unfortunately, <laughs> a lot more risk if things go wrong because things can happen so fast now. Like you said, it used to take months for tea to ship, you know? That was, but now it's like you said, it's it's uh, it's practically overnight. Um, things move so fast. So, so when they get frozen, uh, we we've we've used to only needing to prepare a day ahead. You know, we haven't had to take the care to build something sustainable because if you're working in three month stints, four month stints of sailing, years sometimes of sailing before you're moving goods, it it's just kind of crazy now that it just we really do feel like we've hit this bottom of the funnel moment where things are just swirling around so fast and technology is moving faster than we can really the average person can process it and how that's manifesting on a global scale is that it's like these small microaggressions can grow so big so quick and like you said um, plan was supposed to be 50 years and it, it certainly hasn't been uh, and in a way it's proving the experiment right to a degree because people are still actively um, um, resisting and, and speaking up and living a pro-democratic experience, which if you've paid attention to the United States, gets really messy sometimes. Right. Uh, it's I, very tough. I think fundamentally there's a different philosophy on how the Chinese government sees human being as a whole. I, I, like to give you a bit of a so my first job ever I, I was in china funny enough I, I was in the very very western part of china it's like literally a tipping point a city called Diqing, that is serve as a uh, that serve as a, a a starting point if you want to go into tibet wow if you want to go into tibet that that's where you want to apply for a permit and then from then on travel to Tibet to see the temples and everything, to, to go on to Lhasa. So I was working there for an international hotel chain, building a resort there, right? So the, the resort is very nice. And then, but then when you build a resort in the middle of a mountain, then there's some sort of displacement and then the local populations get disrupted. And and when the local population get disrupted, sometimes, they, 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 I mean, like you say, people are just people, right? when I'm telling you one day to, hey, I'm moving your home, right? I'm gonna build something else that has no direct beneficial to you in the, and your children in the near future, but he's 50 bucks, take it or leave it, right? What would you do? You resist, right? You're trying to find ways to, uh, it's just human nature, right? To try to survive or trying to, 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 to get a fair, what you feel is fair when it comes to your compensation or when it comes to things that you think this, you deserve in your life. So we built this huge resort there. And we have a guy in our hotel staff on the payroll that he doesn't do anything. He's a bit, he, he's from he's, he's from the local region. His name is Hagang. So Hagang sits in the morning meeting and he doesn't do anything. He, he, he pick his thumb, he, he, he pick his nose, he twitter his thumb, and then he'll try to listen. He doesn't even listen to us when, when it comes to uh, the operation of the hotel. But Hogan has a function when it comes to the operation of the hotel. Hogan get things done. So because the local people are upset regarding the building of the resort. So sometimes when we are transporting the guests from the airport to the resort, sometimes they will set up some shitty little roadblocks that would stop the car from passing through. And when I say robot, roadblock, it's literally a stick with some stones, right? Yeah. So the car can drive through without stopping. And they're not trying to ambush us or, try, or do anything like that, right? But, but what they're trying to do is just like maybe collect five RMB, RMB, right? Which is less than a dollar back then. And of course, the guests get spooked and say, oh, what's going on? Or like, I'm on this mountain and then there's some, some like tribal people. Like, they, they literally wear traditional Tibet clothing, right? Oh, it's trying to stop the car. What's going on? And then the hotel manager get agitated and say, hey, Hagang, what's the deal, right? Or like, can we stop this? So Hagang say, yeah, sure. Just call this number whenever this happened. Tell your driver to call this number wherever this kind of things happen. So one day I went to town to pick up some stuff and then I I got, got the driver to drive me back to the, the resort. 
to to the to the, to the dormitory. So then then we got stopped by this uh, this roadblock, right? Again, these are just some ragged villages, tribal villages, uh, Tibet villages, just trying to get some money out of us, right? Trying to survive. And then uh, and then I tell the driver, so are we gonna give him the money or not? I said, no, we call this number. We call her gang. You can't dial this number. And then uh, say, hey, Ogang, some village is stopping our, uh, stopping our car. Can you do something? And within 10 minutes, uh, five, big looking, like buff looking dudes with sticks come out there and they chase the villagers away. And then that never happened again to me. Mm. So, so Hangang is a guy that has connection with the local government. He is there to make sure that this foreign direct investment would go smoothly, as smooth as possible. So then the, the region can benefit when it comes to the, the overall, right? The overall development of the region. So other foreign hotel chain would want to invest in this region in the future. So that goes back to the concept, right? The concept of, of human rights and the perception of human or perception of your citizen in, in the country. Uh, would that happen in the US? Would that happen in, in Europe? If there's a group of local people that is uh, against the opening of a international hotel, I'm sure that would be right. I'm sure that would be. So if I had to open, a, if I want to invest in Memphis and I, if I had to remove your home in the process of doing it, how, how long do you think that would take, Brooks? Right. Yeah, it would be tough. It would be uh, tough, it, right? it, Or it, damn near impossible. Uh, <laughs> Well, it just depends. See, no, because depending they, on the price, right? Well, and not just that; it's all, also depending on culture. Because listen, we've had we've had our fair share of oil companies just right. plow, plowing through native reservation, you know, like native native owned property, and, and it's like, so, yeah, no, I I want to I want to <laughs> really subscribe to like the belief that th that it couldn't happen here, but it. Things like this do happen here. We do have human rights violations that happen. It's on the news. We just choose to turn a blind eye to it as it's happening. Um, and, and we also don't know exactly how to influence it at all. You know? Right. That's really more what it is. It's like we're aware, uh, but it's like how, how would I influence it? I guess for me, it's we do have the, the vote. Um, you have the vote, right? You have a way to influence it, right? There's a way to influence it. You could call the, you could call a journalist. Yes. You could call vice. They can do invest, investigative journalism to expose this. And I've also, <laughs> also on the show, we've discussed like a concept of voting with your dollars, you know, like yeah, you, you vote every day with the companies that you support. And so um, boycotting a company is a, is a thing that you can do. Um, but don't get it twisted, man. Like I, I agree with you. Another is, I'll, I'll try to extract this to take the humanity out of it and just like put some philosophy behind what's going on. Right now, what we're describing is a difference in the US. It's a very individual mind and centric value system. You know, we value the right of the individual above uh, an overarching system telling it what to do. Uh, whereas China and its history of collectively as a culture, they believe in more of a holistic approach. Like you said, ageism is a, is still very embedded in the culture where simply because you're, you know, an age of one year or above, you are culturally expected to adhere to the belief that there is a greater collective than your individual self. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it's, and it's very, very old. It's just now a, applied in a way that has become dogmatic and has become in many ways destructive. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very challenging, but just philosophically, yeah. it's like the difference, but in belief, like the individual is not nearly as important in that side, in that system. So when you yeah. have that guy on the street, he's just some guy on the street that is blocking the fluidity and the unity of the whole. And he, he doesn't understand his place in the whole society needs to get moved along, you know? Uh, and, 
historically they've been more aggressive in the way that they handle those sorts mm. of things especially from a physical perspective and even in in the chinese sense you there, there is a lack of confidence in the collective vision, wisdom of the people mm. learning that in a sense it's always a particular small group of people that who are making the decisions believing that the decision is better than the collective uh eventual collective decision making of the community i mean don't get me wrong right it gets things done much quicker mm. definitely get things done much quicker but in the, but while you're getting things done in that way when you don't have the conversation before you make that kind of decisions then a lot of people human rights get trampled over and a lot of people get lost in the system in a sense that why i believe that like you say the more individual driven kind of a nature of the uh, western or U.S. philosophy, things get done a lot slower. That you have to have a conversation before things happen, right? Most of the time, mm -hmm. most of the time, yeah. and and where in, in in and what China doesn't want is that kind of conversation to happen because I mean, in in their mind, they say, oh, it's for the sake of the progression of the country, for the party, or whatever it is, which is not something that we're used to in Hong Kong. A lot of the decision making, there has to be a consensus, there has to be an engagement process before things get done. Mm. Let's say a government want to roll out this policy of a uh, housing project in this particular area, right? They would initiate a in, initiate a engagement process first. They would do survey, they would do focus group, they would do uh, yeah, they would do the engagement process, right? They would get feedback, and then they would. I mean, sure, they would still do it, maybe, but then they would take those suggestions, they would do this engagement into consideration. That's how a democratic society usually works, right? Usually works. But in China, no, nah, none of that, right? No, no, right now, all the laws, all the policies are being passed with no engagement. Uh, if you look at the news, the opposition party has all massively resigned. So there's no opposition, right? No opposition right now. Yes, I. Uh, that is something that I was going to ask about was the resignation of um, what seemed to be the remaining uh, uh, representatives of that system. Um, and I, I believe I'm correct in saying that there was a slogan for a while that said one country, two systems. Is correct. that is so, that right? So that, so that experiment has essentially they've chosen to end it early and they're trying to go back to a one party, one system type of experience. And there, uh, there are people that have been resisting this transition in the streets, and the political representation has now stepped down. So, um, although I wish that we could tie this up in a pretty little bow, I, I have to ask you: Where do you imagine it's going <laughs> to go in, in the for yeah in, in in the future? So I think the coronavirus situation definitely have split up put a lot of the, uh, uh, the more visible resistant part of things on hold. No, uh, so we can't, we can no longer put two, put, two, put two million people on the streets anymore because of the coronavirus. And then the new uh, national security law has been in place as well. So I think eventually this is something that a lot of us has foreseen in a sense that this is going to be a mutual destruction process in the sense that, uh, I mean, Hong Kong is always important to China in a sense, not in a GDP kind of sense, but in terms of foreign uh, investment, uh, foreign cash flow is always has to go through Hong Kong. If you look at the data, majority of foreign investment came through Hong Kong. Mm. And as days, and, and I don't know what it is. And, and I don't think this will last very long in the sense that not because other city in China is going to take over. It's be, it more is, I mean, think about it. What other country have, how many financial market does this um, a stock market has US has? You have the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones, right? Yeah. And they are all in New York. There's no other stock market other than New York, right? I don't and, believe uh, so, no. And there's one in Tokyo. There's one in London. Yeah, I think I think Frankfurt, right? Frankfurt in Germany. Hmm. Paris, Paris, Paris in France. Only in China you would have three stock markets: one in Hong Kong, one in Shenzhen, one in Shanghai. Hmm. And because they're trying to replace Hong Kong with Shanghai and Shenzhen for a long time, and they couldn't couldn't, couldn't do it. That's why you still have three stock markets, right? And majority of IPO is still done in Hong Kong. 
at least when it comes to foreign investment, like Alibaba, and so then in Hong Kong, right? Mm. So I think eventually, I mean, it really depending on uh, if you ask me, what's going to feel what is it going to be like for people in the low for, for the local Hong Kongers I think it's going to be very bad for the next five ten years in the in terms that the education system right now is being over overhauled uh the press is being overhauled they they're putting a lot of stress on the legal uh adjudication system as well so things are going to become very very China like in the coming future and I think in the long term, that is bad for China. And as, I mean, in the short term, it's bad for Hong Kong, but in the, in the longer term, that is bad for China as well. And uh, I don't, I mean, I uh, maybe going into a territory that I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified to talk about, but I do believe that a lot of it has to, a lot of it has to come down to what the, uh, what the other country that are doing trading with China, what kind of decisions do they want to make? Mm. Are they going to happily, willingly trade with somebody who is uh, a regime who is very, very oppressive? Or are they going to say, you know what, we're going to uh, take a moral stand and then we're going to we're gonna look elsewhere. Mm. So I think, unfortunately, a lot of it is, uh, for, for Hong Kong, a lot of it is, is uh, deciding on the foreign uh, factors right now, particularly when it comes to the trade the trade uh, trade with China from foreign country, which 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 is why there was a lot of uh, support of Trump in Hong Kong in, in 2019 20 because of the rhetoric that he's been spewing against China. Yeah, man. Yo, we have uh, we have crushed on some was, very I, honestly. Like, I really, I, I this is very important information to be and a, a very important conversation note if nothing else for people in this circle this is the i don't know is this something that is a little bit different from what i've I've briefly listened to some of your past podcasts a a bit different (laughs) different. (laughs) well we'll we'll at least um we'll at least get you to answer one main prompt you you can do that yeah yeah all right what do you uh what do you do for fun man and how has that changed over time (laughs) what i do for fun You're I think serious, what I, but you're you're also honestly like what people don't know is that uh this it, this conversation is rather exceptional between me and Eric because we're usually laughing and cutting jokes and um sharing memes and watching anime and shit you know what I mean so we we've catch up on many different fronts but uh tell me about your relationship to fun man. I think fun for me has changed a lot since uh, 2009. So 2019 definitely has changed me as a person a lot in terms of my emotional and also uh, when it comes to fun as well. So these days I'm just trying to appreciate what I have with the relationship that I have with my wife, with my my dog, and also uh, with the people that I have, right? And I, I with people that I I know because I I've been living I've been living overseas away from my family for a lo- for a long time now since I was 14, and I have friends all over the world i'm just trying to connect with them as much as i can just trying to you know show them that i appreciate that uh how they have been part of my journey as a human being how they have impacted my thinking i'm just trying to be a little a, a more explicit when it comes to those kind of stuff right right now yeah so that's and, and also when it comes to fun I, i've been I, reading more recently I've, I've quit instagram i've quit facebook I've, I've 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 completely cut ties with that company so i no longer do social media now uh, i've been reading a lot more uh, i've been playing a lot of uh computer games got a new pc uh been uh, uh for me is always about the story of games so i'm not a big f- fan of games that doesn't have a rich story behind it so yeah, so fun for me. So that's what fun's been for me recently. Beautiful. You know, the answer the question. Not nothing too, nothing too too insightful. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it is important to establish that uh, fun is having fun can be for some people like a true luxury. Not everybody is. Yeah. Um, capable of, of of creating time to have fun 
And I think what you said about uh, just taking uh, inventory on what you do have in life and uh, really stepping into like really loving it as much as you possibly can and doing it full out, like that is just a, it's a real blessing to have. So Absolutely. our friendship and being able to get on a computer and, you know, record live, like a, an actual luxury that, that we have because of uh, the crazy world that we live in has unfolded, unfolded it to be so. And with all, uh, with any luck, we will, this too shall pass. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you sitting down and uh, cutting out some time on your Sunday morning. And I know there will be a part two and, and Eric won part two and we'll, uh, we'll really ramp it up. And have yeah, it. yeah. We can ramp it up and talk about the more serious part of like what I did. For yeah, exactly. For, we'll talk I about see? your profession and talk about play. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have yeah there's time. a lot of stuff. There's a yeah. lot of stuff that I thought about talking as well. Now we'll definitely do a part two. Coming part. Up, brother. For real. For real. All right, man. Cool. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. This this has been fun. As, as you said, this has been fun. This is uh, it's a good way to spend my Sunday morning. For sure. Beautiful, brother. Thank you. My pleasure.